Hi guys, my name is Joe Rogers and I'm the CEO and founder of Navistar Legal. And today we have Jo Ma and she is the CEO and principal of Loughborough College. We are here talking today. Welcome Jo, by the way. Oh, how you doing? We're here talking a little bit about education and um, certainly Jo was the best person to talk about education and how education can support business. Jo, I'm going to hand over to you. My first question really is just about who are you, what do you do, and how did you get to where you are? Thanks, Jo. So thanks very much for, for having me on. So I am currently the, the principal and CEO at Loughborough College in Leicestershire. So we are a large general further education college. So we've got around 11,000 students, 750 staff, and we offer a whole range of education pathways for people that are studying right the way up to degree level. So you could come here and do a BSc honours in sports science, validated by Loughborough University. You could do a degree in engineering, but also you could come and do an entry level course um, right the way from learners that have got special educational needs through to GCSE English and Maths and a whole host of vocational options. And how did you, how did you make that transition? Because I like from, from our conversation you were, you were sharing, You'd actually started in sports. What was the shift for you? Yeah, so I um, was a fully chartered practitioner psychologist um, specialising in sport. Um, and whilst I was doing my master's at Loughborough University, I just got asked to kind of, could you come and do some guest lectures? You know, you, you, know, you get on with students and, you know, um, I like talking. So literally I came over and just did some guest lectures and, and I kind of fell into FE and vocational education, if you like, and really just found a real passion for developing people finding someone's potential and giving them the tools to, to develop that potential. So whether that's in elite sports to try, you know, working to trial for the Olympic Games, or whether that's someone who has come from a secondary school, failed their GCSE maths and needs that support to, to develop and find that passion to be able to pass and to move on into to employment. And so I started out just guest lecturing um, and then just fell in love with supporting people with, you know, life chances and, and their development and progressed from there really in terms of the strategic element. Amazing. And your, well, education, as I understand it, and I am a novice at all of this, but education, it appears to have gone through a huge change over the last eight to 10 weeks. How are you guys managing that? And what has that, how has that impacted you now? Like how do you think it's going to impact you going forward? Yeah, so we are currently open for business, but we're running a virtual college. So we mm. have our students doing online learning. Government are supporting some students on predicted grades so that they're not impacted in terms of their progression through to the next academic year. But there are some qualifications that you simply cannot predict the grade for. You know, if an electrician is coming to your house, you want them to be safe and registered and, and qualified. So we are adopting a phased campus opening from June the 15th with social distancing in place. So I'm in today doing some safety walks. We're working with the union. We're working with our board. We're implementing social distancing so that we can get some small groups of students in mid-June to do their practical sign off and some exams and to start getting back to a fully open campus for um, enrollment in September, which for the first time ever will be 100% online. That's amazing. And what was the point or what was the mindset shift that had to happen? I guess it's not mindset shift. It's, it's more like what was the practical point at which you guys went, right, this has got to go. This is all online. And what what did you have to put in place? Because you guys are, you know, you're, you're run as a business, right? You, have, you like most uh, businesses, you had to create this, this way of working that just wasn't available to you previously. What was that like? And how, what was the thought process behind that? How did you make that happen? Yeah, so, so we had to do a lot of very fast kind of consultation and engagement, both with our staff, students and employers, because, you know, we run a diverse commercial portfolio. So we have employer clients that work with us on full cost training for their apprenticeship provision for, for, for conferences and things. Um, and we needed to think through all aspects of our provision. So for a young person who's 16 years old, who um, has got a young family and is getting on the bus and traveling on the train to get to college, there's a whole different suite of considerations to make, make yeah. sure they've got a laptop and access to the internet. You know, if we've got a young person on free school meals with a family that, you know, is, is, is on um, Job Center Plus on universal credit, then of course we need to make sure that there's internet access, that we're treating people equally and fairly. So we had a whole infrastructure project of making sure the internet was accessible, making sure devices were accessible, 
we were doing socially distanced laptop deliveries. You know, it was that level of, 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 of planning. Our staff were brilliant at adapting because obviously, as you can think through, the kind of working at home safety requirements of ensuring, you know, all the risk assessments were done, ensuring that they've got a good, reasonable office work set up, you know, the staff adapted really quickly. And the only way for, for those people that are in education, even parents that, you know, when it starts to snow and it's like, oh, are we going to be open? Are we going to be closed? What are we going to do? Every single day for the last month has felt like a snow day. You know, that's the only way I can describe the, the shift that we've had to take and the planning. Um, and that's where we are. But, you know, moving to online, Microsoft Teams has been really helpful in terms of that as the, as the interactive tool, because we wanted our learners to have face to face. We wanted to make sure our common strategy was right. Um, so there's been a whole exercise that's happened and we're still doing it. You know, we're planning our phased opening now. We're looking at the next 12 months. You know, we think social distancing could stay with us for up to 12 months and we've got to make a long term plan to ensure that we can adapt. But the staff even managed to run an England hockey training camp virtually with staff and support coaches. So, yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. That's incredible. That's so I mean, that's a testament to, to, to people just wanting to. All right, let's just let's just get on and, and do do what we can. That's amazing. A whole hockey chat, whole, a whole hockey camp. That's incredible. Oh, credit to them. Yeah, I was going to ask you about tech. So you said Microsoft Teams is really working. Like, what's the, what are you finding? Is there a culture shift that's happening in, in the team, in, in the college at the moment that, that's positive or negative for, uh, you know, culturally around, around that digitization piece? Yeah, and I think in education, we talk often about um, digital natives and digital immigrants. So if you, you know, if, if there's anyone in business that's got a five year old at home that knows how to download an app, you know, we've got five year olds that are starting to use SQL. Whereas, you know, I'm in my mid thirties, but actually my first iPad would have been at 2021. So, so we, our young people are going to be at least 20, 25 years ahead of where any of us are if we're all right now so so you've got then your staff are reasonably they're on that spectrum so there'll be staff members that are you know towards the end of their career that are having to adapt and having to make those changes um that maybe find that a little bit more training and support requirement than staff members that you know have, have come out of a degree three or four years ago and uh, you know have gone through their own education with much more uh, online tools and, and assisted technology so i think in any business i always look at it and think my staff are almost they're on that standard deviation curve and how do we bespoke the training and support at each end of the curve and make sure we stretch those departments that are thriving that are adapting you know if my computing games and media department weren't absolutely loving life and smashing it out of the park i would be concerned right now whereas actually clearly my arts team would need a different method because you know what they are doing is very physical is very hands-on and very creative they need to adapt in a different way so so it, i think it's just making sure that we put training and support in place but then we set consistent organizational standards to say okay this is what a learner can expect on this course and here's a set of parameters that we can communicate with parents learners and and then and get the staff to that standard whilst ensuring we're still pushing the innovating innovation as we develop it's it, like honestly it sounds exhausting it's like all of these <laughs> like i'm listening to you and i'm thinking thank god i'm not running an organization like that that sounds exhausting and kind of looking at all the different managers i'm, I'm assuming you have a team together that, that's supporting you with doing all of this and i know like that that's this is huge organizational change in in a situation which you in which there's not much more funding <laughs> there's, and there's less there's, significantly yeah, less. and there's actually significantly less help because i mean even I know this is just a an example but you know my parents had a had this my parents had a sick uh, parent with them and and just simple things like getting some support is quite tough so you're you're running it not just in uh, an environment that is difficult but you're running it with people or in a, in a way running it with people who may or may not be able to um, digitize themselves quickly uh, god how is that work anyway that, that's just a, that's just an observation not a question but the question really for me is how are you managing all of this personally how is this affecting you personally um you know for me uh, you know i've got an incredible work ethic and you know and i love what i do but you know and i've kind of i've built a home office obviously you know i'm back in work today this is my work office um but you know it's just involved a, a huge amount of hours in terms of you know weekends are kind of non-existent but then in lockdown um you know other than um you know exercising and doing all your home stuff it's not like you can go on holiday or away so kind of just adapting around that um 
I'm a very structured person and I make sure that, you know, my work day is my work day. So I try and mimic my work routine at home and it, even down to getting dressed for work. So I've not had a single day when I've not been ready for work. Um, I've tried to kind of keep myself really healthy. So I've been planning in my exercise schedule in and around the fact that I've not got a commute at the minute. So, so those kind of things and just trying to find the small little gains. So even though there's a lot of hours and, and, and I know the whole of industry will be doing exactly the same. For me, it's trying to find the things that you can look at in the more positive sense and say, well, actually, I've just managed to nip my dog out for a walk at lunchtime because, you know, of course, you know, if you're a dog walking company, they've also been, you know, in lockdown. Um, the ordinary, I wouldn't be able to do that. So just the silly little things, try and enjoy those things that you can do. But yeah, I've had to work a lot of weekends and, you know, into the evenings just to try and make sure I'm on top of it. But recognising, you know, I changed roles in the last kind of six, seven weeks. So if I was at my old college, maybe, you know, I would have done a little bit less because, you know, you're more established, you know, your systems, you know, and, and those kind of things. Yeah, so this is just, not only this is a new environment, but this is oh, an entirely new role for you as well. Wow, gosh, <laughs> that's incredible. And we were talking before about the sort of things, actually some of your values and beliefs around, around your students and education. And so I, like one thing that I got from you the minute we had a conversation was your passion and enthusiasm for growing leaders, like growing leaders being a broad statement, like literally giving people the education they need. Tell me a little bit about that. Tell me about your values and beliefs around education and, and what is so important to you. Yeah, so, so for me, um, you know, I firmly believe in, in our civic leadership responsibility in general further education colleges. And, you know, I'd say to any business, if you don't know who your local college principal is, find out because all my colleagues, they're built on how do we support social value and social mobility? We absolutely see our role as developing people where they can, you know, we, we transform lives every day in our sector. So we're enabling people to give them, them the tools to progress in their life and in their careers. So whether that's onto higher levels of education, into the workplace, onto an apprenticeship, we are simulating economic growth, but doing it in a way that recognizes the individual personal journey that it takes to go on that. So we are, you know, blessed with a wealth of staff that just put people first. And I think if they do that and they put time and attention and care into young people, adults, we work across the spectrum and we do that with, with integrity and with passion, then, then how can we not have a thriving sector? There's 244 colleges across the country standing ready to say, to business, we are here to support your skills, changing needs, the changing workforce. We know, unfortunately, some people have made redundant at this time, some businesses won't survive. And actually, a lot of what we do, we can attract government funding. So whilst we're private industry, in, in a sense, in terms of we can liquidate, we have, um, you know, we have to make generate a surplus. We, we have elements of public funding, so we, we adopt public value in, in how we go about our business. And there's a lot of things we can do that can support the recovery from coronavirus and that whole notion that the CBI are trying to promote around that build back better. So, you know, I think we've got a lot of fantastic mm. colleges across the country that are all very minded that, that it's absolutely our role to be at the forefront of that. And I think by putting people first, and that's not students first, staff second, they've got to be first equal um, because healthy, happy staff support healthy, happy young people. Um, then, then that's the ethos that I think that I personally take. And I think a lot of my colleagues would, would probably say the same.